Art is a weapon for social change. First, I'd like to give a shout out to the super talented animation artist who did that, Jamie Lynn, and also it's actually a high school classmate who did the music, Daryl Baker. As you can see, I brought my fan uh, in case I get overheated because I'm so excited about the topic. Art is a weapon for social change. I believe that art has the power to counteract and transcend racism, sexism, classism, or any other ism that comes to mind. I believe that music, dance, poetry, painting, photography can help bring peace to this nation and this world. Okay, I know some of you might be skeptical. I'm looking at your faces. Some of you might be skeptical. You might be thinking, in this time of polarized politics, guns, drones, and nuclear armament, how can a pen on paper or paint on canvas solve such deep-rooted problems? That very question guides my research and my creative work and my mission in life. As a professor of American history and African American studies, I consider it my privilege to teach students about the long history of artistic activism. One of my favorite examples is Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson was an all-American athlete, an accomplished actor and vocalist. He was so brilliant, sometimes I wonder if he's a superhero, but that's a side note. He also happened to pass away the day before I was born, so I consider his example a source of inspiration. Paul Robeson used his deep baritone voice and his celebrity status to draw the world's attention to the need for racial justice, racial equality in America. There are so many examples of artists who are also freedom fighters that now I like to say to anyone who doubts the power of art, you may think that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Today I'm going to talk about three main examples. First, Negro spirituals. Second, the life and times of choreographer and dancer Pearl Primus. Third, my own work. By using these examples, I'm going to show you how art has been used as a weapon for social change to first educate and enlighten, to, to advance political awareness, so the first use is political, and then the second use is spiritual. Art is used to uplift, to renew the spirit. Because this conference is about conflict and violence, I can't think of that topic without thinking about the transatlantic slave trade. So this is the brutal institution in which over 11,313,000 Africans were enslaved. Think about that number. Shipped from the western coast of Africa to the Americas, this illustration documents the Middle Passage. You see slaves were packed like sardines, side by side, shackled, no place to move. This dehumanizing, brutal, institution gave birth to some of the most beautiful music that we know. Negro spirituals. Wade in the Water is one of my favorite Negro spirituals. Wade in the Water is one of my favorite Negro spirituals because it represents how art can be a weapon for social change in terms of spiritual renewal uplift. The song has a double meaning. First, the literal meaning is about slaves escaping from the south to the north along the Underground Railroad. How many of you know that Cincinnati is an important location on the Underground Railroad? Raise your hand. OK, A plus for all of you. Good job. This is a picture that I took of the Ohio River. So when slaves crossed over from Kentucky into Ohio, they were free. So I like to think about this city where we live as a place of freedom. Now there's a double meaning. The second meaning of wade in the water is spiritual. 
It's about baptism. It's about uplift. So just as the children of Israel in the Exodus story escaped from Pharaoh through the Red Sea to Canaan land's freedom, that story motivated slaves to think of a better life, to think of a better life in the afterlife, but also freedom in the here and now through the Underground Railroad. Now let's think about slavery in other art forms. First, we have the example of, Be of Beloved, written by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison is one of my favorite writers. She's also an Ohio homegirl. She's from Lorain, Ohio. She wrote this, the novel Beloved based on a real life story of a woman named Margaret Garner, who decided when she escaped, again, over the Ohio River from Kentucky into Ohio to freedom, she then heard slave masters were after her. She was considered an escaped slave. And when she heard that there were slave masters uh, after her, she decided she would rather kill her three children than have them endure that brutal institution. So imagine that, this is based on a historical truth. If you're a parent in this room, if you're a mother, if you're a father, imagine that, that psychological trauma, that brutal reality. In this book, Beloved is the one child she succeeds in, in killing, and she becomes a spirit, a ghost. The reason why this novel is so important, it's not only important because she won the Pulitzer Prize for it in 1988, and then later, Toni Morrison wins the Nobel Prize for Literature, but I think it's important because it's a study in our history, and it's a study in, in slavery that gets at the spiritual, emotional, psychological trauma that you don't necessarily understand by just reading a history book. Now you might be familiar with slavery through current day films. Raise your hand if you've seen 12 Years a Slave. Okay, okay. Also, uh, raise your hand if you've seen Django with Jamie Foxx. Okay, I put this picture of Jamie Foxx as Django, dressed in his blue suit. If you saw the film, you have to remember the blue suit, right? First of all, Jamie Foxx would just look good in about anything. <laughs> Love Jamie Foxx. Still, there is an artistic purpose to this outfit. He takes on the attire of the slave masters, and then he, he adds his own swag, his own flavor with this turquoise blue as a mode of resistance to the slave masters as he goes back to the plantation to save the woman he loves, played by Carrie Washington. So even though that's a fictitious example of slavery, I still think this film is important because it gets at the, the trauma, the violence, but also the resistance. Now let's fast forward, move forward in history. We're gonna fast forward, this is long after slavery has been abolished, but racism, segregation, racial violence still exists and persists. So this is the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s America. The new dance group is a dance group that decided to speak out against racial injustice and also class oppression. The new dance group, their model was Dance is a weapon for social change. So, as you can see, my title, Art is a Weapon for Social Change, I'm riffing off of that. In 1941, this dancer, it's on your far left there, Pearl Primus, she made history as the first black dancer to join the new dance group. She wholeheartedly accepted this mission that dance can be a way to educate, raise awareness, and encourage political action. She's known for her choreography to the song Strange Fruit. Raise your hand if you've heard of the song Strange Fruit. Okay. The song Strange Fruit, written by a Jewish American school teacher, was popularized by jazz vocalist Billie Holiday, and it was monumental in which she delivered it to an integrated audience at Greenwich Village Cafe Society, um, a protest song against lynching, a protest song against racial violence. Well, 
Pearl Primus, in 1943, decides to choreograph a piece to that poem without any music. And it, it's a stark, haunting, vivid representation of what that trauma of lynching is. A little background on lynching. It's a dark moment in American history. There's been a long history, we're talking especially after the end of the slavery, through um, the, the beginning of the civil rights movement, in which black men were attacked, hanged, burned. I consider this um, a comparable example to Gladiator. If you've seen the, the film Gladiator, it's considered almost a spectator sport because you see the man in the picture pointing at the bodies, um, and people would take souvenirs. They would take bits of burned hair and, and clothing. These men were often accused, falsely accused, of flirting with a white woman, whistling at a white woman, or even rape. In actuality, this is something that's not well known. These men were often successful businessmen. So successful businessmen in competition with white businessmen, and some white businessmen could not handle that reality of these newly freed people um, being their equals or even outshining them, that this was the response, racial violence. But in response to that violence, Pearl Primus uses dance as a weapon for social change. She dances to raise awareness, and her art is very much a part of the civil rights movement. Pearl Primus said in 1944, this dance is truly a social weapon. Its results are not immediate, for education is a slow process, but it contributes something. So she wasn't just this Pollyanna person who thought art solves all problems, but she understood the role of art as pushing for freedom. Please note her soaring leap there. That's one thing Pearl Primus is known for, these soaring leaps. And she said that she did this because she's trying to transcend our worldly notions, rigid notions of black, white, self, and other, and she's trying to reach towards the heavens. Now that brings me to my own art. In my own art, I try to use my art to educate and to uplift. So you recognize the uh, top corner there, Muhammad Ali. We often think of Muhammad Ali as an athlete, but today I want to think of him as an artist, as a poet. You know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. The hands can't hit what the eyes can't see. So even as he says that, I think he's getting at that core sense of art representing our humanity, our oneness, and our, our true beauty. Here at the bottom, I have Nina Simone. Nina Simone is known as the secular voice of the civil rights movement. The thing I like about Nina Simone is she tells it like it is. We know we shall overcome is a popular song. Well, Nina Simone wrote and sang the song Mississippi Goddamn to talk about racial violence and even freedom riders in Mississippi who were killed just trying to register black people to vote. So that sense of rage, that sense of, of despair or just anger is also part of that civil rights movement. Now, this is one of my, my favorite people to talk about, Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, topic of my next book. Uh, Jimi Hendrix also used his music to uplift, okay? So, as a child, he grew up very poor in Seattle. And in Seattle, he would attend church with his grandmother, a, a Pentecostal uh, woman. And he said that he was so poor, he would go to church in tattered clothing, and he felt criticized and ostracized. Well, when he becomes a musician, he created what he called the electric church. So his role, his goal was to reach into the souls of the listeners and raise them to a higher level. So he takes that ostracism, let's think about art as a weapon for social change. He takes that rejection and uses it as a source of inspiration to, to reach out. At the time of the intersections of the civil rights movement, 
the anti-Vietnam War movement, and also feminism. He's this voice that's telling people to come together for equality. This is another example of my artwork. This is an ebook that I created. It's called The Art of War and Peace. And I created uh, these images here. I'm riffing off of the Buddhist art form called mandalas. Raise your hand if you've heard of mandalas. So mandalas are these intricate, beautiful designs often made from very brightly colored sand. And Buddhist monks will spend days, days, sometimes weeks creating these. Then they destroy them. So it's this whole idea of non-attachment, non-attachment even to something that's beautiful. Well, as I created these images, I first started with a hand drawing, and then I layered it with photographs I took, and then my sense of non-attachment was added by manipulating it digitally, all with my smartphone. And so in doing that, I'm making the point that we should be non-attached to the sense of self and other. Because I think at the root of any conflict, at the root of any violence, even take the case of George Zimmerman and, and Trayvon tragedy, I think at the root of that conflict was this idea of self and other. You are different than me, so I should be afraid of you. So this is an international appeal in the cause of peace. And just in this awesome world of social media, these uh, poets I collaborated with are from Egypt, Australia, Canada, London, the United States, and many of them I haven't even met in person. I've met them through social media. Now I'm gonna conclude with this. This image is on the whiteboard in my kitchen. So this is a glimpse at how art functions in my everyday life. Michaela is the daughter of a very good family friend, and Michaela is nine. And months ago, she wrote this on my board, and why do you think I have not erased it? I have not erased it because it makes me happy. So let's talk about that as a, a method of social change, this way that art can bring happiness. Just recently, my mom said to me, oh, there's this guy who wears this big hat that sings this song called Happy. And I said, mom, that's Pharrell. <laughs> I've been a Pharrell fan for a very long time. But as we think about the role of art as this way to renew the spirit, to uplift, I think this is important. So in this time of even continued turbulent economics, this time of uh, continued violence, I think art promotes the creative thought that it takes to solve very difficult problems. So to all the artists out there, I say, write on, write on, stay strong, keep creating. To all the educators out there, I say, keep using art in innovative ways to educate students. And to everyone else, I say, go out, support a local dance group, see theater, go to the movies. Because I believe that through the process of appreciating art, we witness the struggles and the brilliance of humanity. And through the process of creating art, we surrender to the brilliance within ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>